It's not. Hi guys, uh, welcome to another online service, and I hope we don't have too many more of these, uh, that we can begin to have at least some more attend the church, but hopefully they won't prevent us from singing as they did in Germany. Church services were on in Germany today, but they could not sing. 
because uh, singing might cause the spread of uh, COVID. But let's see how it all works out. Welcome anyways. Hey, um, just want to say that um, often we don't have a sense of the presence of God uh, in routine life and sometimes in online gatherings. Um, or the presence of God is in and out, like suddenly we are aware of him, suddenly we are not. Uh, the thing is, if I don't have a sense of his presence, I'm hamstrung in expressing worship and glorifying God. Uh, it, it's almost this a need to cultivate or engage his presence and majesty through things that are routine, through uh, times like this where you're in your home, uh, there's nothing, no prop, nothing conducive to uh, helping you enter into a time of worship. And at that time, the only thing that can prevent you be from being hamstrung is uh, to engage uh, or cultivate um, a sense of the presence of God here and the majesty of God. I don't, uh, I think it was Brother Lawrence, that um, guy who wrote quite a few amazing books about the presence of God. He said, when I wash my dishes, when I'm doing routine, I begin to imagine that the only person on the earth is me and that there is only God and me on the earth. And as I begin to think like that, I begin to practice his presence. And I think he wrote a book called Practicing the Presence. Uh, and so that's the uh, thing I'd suggest today, that um, you engage his presence and his majesty wherever you are. And what happens when you engage his presence and majesty is that it forces you to make choices. When we are not aware of his presence, we can make whatever choice we want. But when his presence and his majesty is uh, uh, tangible because we uh, cultivate an acute awareness of it, then you have to make choices. Do I pick up the phone to text? Do I take a break and go for a coffee? I'm not talking about during online worship services. I'm talking anytime. Where you suddenly become aware that, am I, am I going to be Martha or am I going to be Mary? And may it extend to our times of online worship too. Even when I'm sitting here and when I'm not doing stuff and I'm sitting at the back, uh, I try to cultivate an awareness of his presence and engage his majesty so that without any protocol, um, any need to have me propelled into his presence, I become aware and I so encourage you to do that. And that then forces us to make choices. Do I choose to be Mary or do I choose to be Martha? Can I disengage and take a break? Can I uh, look at my phone and start a chat? Or do I stay with this? Yeah, so just be aware of that as we um, begin this service. I just want to start with these three simple choruses and uh, we'll take it from there. Great in power, great in glory, you're great in mercy, you're the king of heaven, you're great in battle, you're great in wonder, you're great in Zion. Your king over all the earth. Come, church. Great in power. You're great in glory. You're great in mercy. You're the king of heaven. You're great in battle. You're great in wonder, you're great in Zion, you're king over all the earth. One more time. You're great in power, you're great in glory, you're great in mercy. You're the king of heaven. You're great in battle. You're great in wonder. You're great in Zion. You're the king over all the earth. You're the king of heaven. 
the King over all the earth. Be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you, the slain and risen King, I lift my voice to heaven, singing, Worthy, Lord of all. Be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations you are worthy lord of all unto you the slain but risen king i lift my voice to heaven singing worthy lord of all you know this song this song always reminds me of Revelations 4 and 5. We are talking about thousands and thousands of generations, eh? Joining before the throne with the elders, with myriads of angels. Declaring not just to the slain, but to the risen and ascended king that you alone are worthy. Yeah? So let's just sing it a couple of times. Be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations you are worthy lord of all unto you the slain and risen king i lift my voice to heaven singing worthy lord of all engage his majesty be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you, the slain and risen King, I lift my voice to heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all. Ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God, all glory. We ascribe to you, O oh God. Come, church. We ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God, all praise. Ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God, all glory. We ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God. We ascribe to you, O oh God, all praise. Be a throne. Be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice to heaven, singing, Worthy, Lord of all. Change the words of this next song a little. Just sing along. Hear these praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, the praises start. You love me so much. Jesus, you love me so much. Hear these 
praises from a grateful heart each time I think of you the praises just start you love me so Lord, I love you. My soul sings. I don't have the words, but sing along. Lord, I love you. My soul sings. In your presence. In your presence. Carried on your wings. Carried on your wings. One more time. Lord, I love you. My soul sings. In your presence carried on your wings. I love you so much. Love you so much. Jesus, love you so much. One last time, hear these praises. Hear these praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, the praises start. One more time, hear these praises. Hear these praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, the praises start. You love me so much. Jesus, you love me so much. From grateful heart, each time we think of you, the praises just start. Hear these praises, hear these praises from grateful heart. Each time we think of you, the praises just start. You love us so. Even if a mother forgets you, how can I forget you, says the Lord. I've inscribed you, I've tattooed you on my hand. On the palm of my hands, I tattooed you. Your walls are forever before me. Each time I think of you, the praises start. You love me so much. Jesus, you love me so You love me so much, Jesus. I dare to believe, oh God, I dare to believe how much you love me. You love me so much, Jesus. You love me so much. We give you all the glory we give you all the glory we give you all the glory and we worship we worship you, oh Lord, you are 
so worthy to be praised and you are alpha and omega you are alpha and omega you are alpha and Omega, and we worship you, our God. You're so worthy to be praised. Want to say your presence? is heaven right now to us and your presence is heaven to us oh jesus oh jesus your presence is heaven to us, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Your presence is heaven to us. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Reign over. I worship to you from different parts of the earth. Father, we're going to listen to uh, Evan read from Genesis um, 8 and 9, portions from Genesis 8 and 9. And uh, then we'll go into a time of teaching. But we thank you for your presence. You've, you've caught our attention, oh God. And we'll engage you through the next few hours and then into the routine of our lives. We bless you. We bless you. And he sent the wind. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent the wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the hundred and fifty days the water had gone down, and on the seventeenth day of the seventh month the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After forty days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch, because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. So Noah came out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of a human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, 
and fill the earth. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth, and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a, f a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Hey guys, so um, I want to tell you a story before we go into the teaching. Uh, so um, there were these two five-year-old kids. This actually happened on Thursday, okay? So there were these two five-year-old kids at a daycare in Richmond. And uh, it had just finished raining and these two kids were walking and they asked their teacher, how come there's no rainbow uh, uh, in the sky? And so the teacher turned to these five-year-olds and said to them, why don't you ask God? And so then they were walking past the manager's room and uh, the manager happens to be a friend of mine. And so they asked her, uh, um, as they were passing her door, they turned up and they said, Oh God, can you send a rainbow? These are five-year-old kids, eh? And they walked past her room and she heard it. And uh, that afternoon, uh, I had this amazing rainbow appear that I saw from my balcony and I took pictures of it. And um, it, I've never seen a full arc, eh? Like a full arc. Um, and so I took a picture of it and I... Uh, sent it to this friend of mine saying, hey, look, there's a rainbow. And she said, you won't believe what these five-year-olds were asking. They were asking for a rainbow. I'm going to send this picture to them. Shortly after that, Jeevan sends me a picture. This was again on Thursday. Because th on Thursday in Nandigama in India, uh, there was another rainbow around the same time or a little earlier. And so Jeevan sends me this picture. And when I showed Jeevan the picture that I had taken, Jeevan decided to put it together. And so now you have uh, this rainbow. Uh, I think you can see it there. So if you flip it around, you'll see Vancouver. And if you hold it this way, you'll see Nandigama. But it was this full arc eh, that they saw in Nandigama and that they saw in uh, Vancouver. And so we put the pictures together. And... Uh, I thought it was fascinating. And when the kids saw it on Friday, you couldn't believe what they thought, eh? Because these are two five-year-olds who asked God for a rainbow. And so uh, my friend told them that, listen, this was a rainbow in Vancouver, but this was a rainbow in India. And look how God just answered your prayers. And so there is this idea of the promise of God that begins to break through. Uh, and one of the things I wanted us to do today uh, during this service is... Um, I want you to begin to write down um, four different promises that God has given you. Um, and so uh, right now, if you can write down an active promise of God, something that's happening in your life right now. You can see that image there. So in that column which says active promise, write down something that at presently is happening in your life. I'll take time to write down too. What is an active promise that is happening in your life right now? An active promise that's happening in your life. I'll tell you an active promise that's happening in my life um, uh, that was given to me just when COVID started. And it was a verse which said, um, and this was a promise from God saying, I will not let affliction come near you and I will not let the enemy exact a price from you. That was the promise given to me. And it's an active promise. And then a few days later, God followed it up with, uh, my spirit is a spirit of life and he hovers over you. 
And so I've held on to these three promises through um, the time that I was traveling just before the uh, um, quarantine happened and stuff like that. These are active promises in my life. What is an active promise in your life? Just write it down. An active promise. It doesn't have to do with COVID. It could be in some other area of your life. An active promise is something that's presently active in your life. That God has said, either through a, a, a rhema word or through the um, uh, Bible where a passage sprung out at you. Or just a promise that is yes and amen in Christ. Cool. Let's go into the teaching now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me. Guys, so I want to talk about uh, what most everybody in the world is talking about, modeling. Uh, don't worry. I'm not talking about that kind of modeling, uh, though I would be qualified. Uh, we are talking about this modeling that people talk about uh, with regard to uh, how do we uh, model for post-COVID? How what are the uh, what are the things that should be open? What what are the things that should be shut? What distances should be maintained? How many should gather together? And so we keep hearing this word modeling, and so um, just as the world is doing it, uh, before the world even thinks of it, we as believers need to do it. Eh? And so how do we model for a post-COVID world? Because the waters are beginning to recede and the rainbow is appearing. Because the waters are beginning to recede and the rainbow is appearing. Some, some parts of this message will not be uh, prophetic as in a prophetic word, but will be prophetic as in the foresight of God. Yeah? So how do we model for the post-COVID COVID world as, a, as churches? Uh, because the waters are receding and the rainbow is appearing. And modeling uh, is always based on data. Modeling is always based on data. And so um, it is basically forecasting what to expect and therefore how to prepare. Modeling is forecasting what to expect. And how to prepare for it. That's what modeling is. And it, 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 it comes to these conclusions by ext extracting data. So it's based on data and it's forecasting of what to expect and therefore how to prepare. The church needs to do that. And man, if there's anyone in a, in a position to do that accurately, it is us. It is us. Our data is extracted from Genesis 8 and 9. Our data is extracted from Genesis 8 and 9, which was what Evan read. Our data is extracted from Genesis 8 and 9. And so today we look at the broad preparations churches have to make, the broad preparations churches have to make. And uh, in the weeks ahead, we'll get more specific. But today we'll deal with the broad preparations that churches have to make. Yeah? 
Any questions? And so most, uh, most of the time will be in Genesis 8 and 9. So when you look at Genesis 8.1, let's begin there. Uh, and so w what are we doing here? We are saying, look at Genesis 8 and 9. There was a time when the world was shut down. But when the waters begin to recede, the rainbow appeared and God began to plan for the future. So what does it look like? And so we base it on Genesis 8 and 9. And uh, what we are doing is saying, okay, God, so these are the things you want us as churches to pay attention to. And so we will decide now to be deliberate in paying attention to these things because you are planning for a post-COVID model. And the church, before anyone else, should be ready for it. It, it, is, it is a crying shame when the loudest voices in churchianity are talking doomsday, wealth transfer, and revival. But the loudest voices are not the rightest voices. So, let's look at Genesis 8.1. So, in Genesis 8.1, it talks about how God sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. God sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. That's what it says in the second half of Genesis 8.1, that God sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Uh, and it is uh, kind of what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, uh, where if you read it from the message, it says that gale force winds hit the house. And that the wildfire of the Spirit began to spread through their ranks. And so, um, one of the things that we need to be aware of as uh, the waters of COVID recede and the rainbow begins to appear, one of the things we need to be aware of is that this is the time of the greatest activity of the Holy Spirit. And it's ironic, not ironic, it is awesome that uh, in 2019, November, December, God very clearly told us at Acts 29 that 2020 will be the year of the Holy Spirit. I mean, at that time, we had no idea. China had no idea. Nobody had an idea of what awaited. And yet around uh, October or November of 2019, God was saying, guys, 2020 for you will be the year of the Holy Spirit. So begin to know how to open yourself up to receive him like you never have before. And I want to say to you, as he has always done, eh? guys, uh, sometimes we need to look at the stories of the Bible so that we can figure out, on one hand, the patterns of God and the devices of the devil. Sometimes I hear um, preachers that I respect say, oh, we don't have to worry about the devil. We don't have to pay attention to him. Focus on Jesus Christ. That's nice, but that is not wise. Nice never means wise. We are supposed to look at stories in the Bible to figure out, aha, this situation has happened before, because like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. When you look at stories in the Bible, you begin to see how God is going to respond, and you also see the devices of the devil, because the devil is no creator. He's very limited. He's He's finite. He can only have so many tricks in his bags that he keeps repeating. It's just packaging. And then you look at how God moves in situations like this and you realize that in our present predicament, which has happened many times in the past, how does God move? And you always find him moving upon the face of the waters. Eh? You always find him moving upon the face of the waters. It talks about that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. He moved upon the face of the waters. In uh, John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus said, Hey, come to me, and I will give you waters of living water, um, um, oodles of living water, so that it can pour through you. And in John 20, verse 21 and 22, Jesus turns to his disciples after he rises from the dead and he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm trying to tie together these three um, because. We need to understand that um, Acts 29, for sure, before all this happened, it was told us that this is the year of the Holy Spirit. 
as the wind begins to blow over the earth again, the waters will recede and we will begin to see the activity of the Spirit in our lives and through our lives like we have never seen before. I look forward to December sometimes when stuff like this is spoken to look back and see, did it really happen? So every morning, like I've said in past teachings, open your arms wide and say to God, I receive your spirit. I receive your spirit this morning. Let what Jesus said in John 7, 37 come to pass where he, he bursts through us because he's moving over the waters, man. You know, it's, uh, it's this idea of running with the wind of the spirit. Zechariah 6, 8 talks about these uh, four winds uh, symbolized by chariots being pulled. And there is this one chariot that is pulled by black horses that begins to head towards the north. And you hear God saying, see the wind of my spirit that has headed towards the north has given rest to my spirit in the north. There is this idea of moving with the spirit post-COVID. Guys, this is when the church has always been meant to arise. This is Isaiah 60. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Isaiah is saying it to the rest of the world. Great darkness covers the earth, but greater is the glory of God. Through whom? Who carries the glory of God now? I don't know how far this message will reach, but I'm telling you, man, these messages are going forth. I got this picture of horses running, eh? And uh, uh, it's a very simple uh, picture. But you can see as one horse begins to turn, the rest of them begin to turn. Is it on screen? This picture of horses? Oh, don't worry about it if it's not. <laughs> Josh is eating far away today. I can hear spoons and forks and Coke cans opening, but he's eating far enough. So you can't really hear him. Is it Josh or is it me? It's Josh, right? Yeah. Yeah, Josh, could you come here for a second? Uh, <laughs> I just want to show you. Guys, for whatever reason, I mean, I don't know whether we planned it or not. I don't remember. But everyone seems to be wearing a Canuck jersey around here. So this is Josh. I can smell the food off you. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 that, I have that picture on my phone, and every time I look at it, I think of... Spirit of God, every time you begin to turn, an entire group of people must begin to shift. And if you, uh, I mean, there's that Newsboys song. I don't know if you've heard of that famous group. It's one of Jane's favorite groups. And so when you veer left, they veer left. When you veer right, you veer right. And so there's a sense of doing exactly that, eh? Okay. That's the first thing that we'll need to pay attention for. How do we model based on data how do we forecast what to expect and how do we prepare for it? One of the first things is this will be a time of unprecedented spirit activity. The second thing is, guys, um, in Genesis 8, 9, and this is really bothersome, eh? Genesis 8, 9, Noah sends out a raven and a dove in order to determine the conditions on earth. Genesis 8, verse 9, Noah sends out a raven and then a dove in order to determine the conditions on earth. And he sends them out a few times. Uh, and why is it that a man who received directions from God regarding the corruption of the earth, regarding the building of the ark, regarding the impending storm, regarding how, what kind of animals to bring into the ark, why is it that the same man who received directions from God regarding everything is now resorting to birds to figure out when it is time to step on the earth? Moses fell into the same trap in Deuteronomy 122. We often think that the spies were God's idea. The 12 spies that were sent out were God's idea. The 12 spies were a result of Moses listening to the demand of the people who wanted to make sure that before they stepped into the promised land that uh, we better check it out and have observable data to verify that it's a good idea to go into the promised land. And one of the things I felt... God saying to us as a church with uh, regard to Genesis 8-9 is, Thus far you have walked listening to me, but know that 
you need to develop not herd immunity, but immunity from the herd. They talk about herd immunity. You have to develop something called immunity from the herd. Where post-COVID, you'll find that there'll be increased demands on how to um, figure out life. There'll be uh, ways of um, um, quick fixes that'll launch life again. There'll be new fears. There'll be new rumors. There'll be worldly counsel and advice as to how you should go about your work, how you should go about church, what is good, what is popular, what is successful, what is safe, what is unsafe. And I'd say to you, live by the proceeding word. I, you know, what happened to Elijah should not happen to us. Here's what happened to Elijah. Elijah had a massive victory on Mount Carmel, and then he let his guard down. And Jezebel scared him so much that this great prophet resigned from life and was raptured, in a sense of speaking. It is during times like this that we realize that, huh, this is just fire falling from heaven to set a fire, set a flame, the sacrifice. But now that it is done, we prepare to bring back apostate, apostate Israel back to true religion. Fighting this virus in the name of Christ and in the protection of Christ is one thing. Now preparing a world that has been undone is also the work of the church. We are reformers, guys. We are reformers. It's, it, it's a bad idea to revive what is not reformed. I've said this before. To reform is to put back in place as God had meant things to be. When you revive without reforming, what happens is that which hasn't been fixed now gets revived. I mean, let's assume someone br broke a hand, and so you go to the doctor, and the doctor fixes the hand this way. And now you can revive this hand, but this hand will revive this way when it's supposed to be here. Reforming is what is required before reviving. And so let's keep operating by the proceeding word, eh? Why do you keep talking about the proceeding word, Jacob? Because that's what Jesus said he does. Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by what the herd tells them to live as. Man shall not live by formulas. Man shall not live by the demands that um, the world, mammon, the business world, the banks, uh, and rules are making on them. Man shall live by the word that comes out from the mouth of God. We follow rules, but we know that there is someone else who directs our lives, eh? Especially as a body of Christ, it is required of us during times like this to begin to rise up because the earth needs the church to be the voice and the hands and the feet of God more now than ever. And exhausted people, a weary people, are easily taken out. It's the stragglers that are taken out when a herd gets weary. This message is not just for Acts 29, eh? You know, it's odd. Huh? Here's the thing, guys. When, 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 when teachings like this are spoken, two or three things happen. One, Acts 29 benefits. Two, other churches that by some way or the other are connected with people um, uh, that um, we know in different parts of the world are affected. But three, God never does anything before he announces it. And this is one way that it hits the airwaves. That the God of the universe is about to do something. Let it now be heard. There's a clarion call that must go out. And once it goes out, heaven's intents are established on earth because the voice of heaven must first be heard. This is how it works. And so when you hear this, this must become part of you so that you can voice it because out of your heart, your mouth will speak, eh? Any wisdom that comes out of your mouth must be wisdom that has sunk into your heart. So these are teachings that are meant to be spread through you by the Spirit. So when people ask you, so what's your church doing uh, uh, during COVID? You should say the waters are beginning to recede. The rainbow has come out. And we are beginning to model what to expect and how to prepare. 
Remember, you're a majority of one. These are broad strokes. In the weeks ahead, we'll get more specific. The third thing, and like I said, we're extracting everything out of Genesis 8 and 9. The third thing, in, extra, in Genesis 8.20, Genesis 8.20, the first thing Noah does is to engage in worship, and he builds an altar. And this is the first reference to an altar in the Old Testament. The first reference to worship was in Genesis 4, where Seth uh, um, begins to worship. But the first reference to an altar is in Genesis um, 8, verse 20, where the first thing Noah does once he uh, emerges from the uh, ark is he begins to engage in worship, and he builds an altar to Yahweh. And the centrality of worship at the end of the day, whether you look at Noah or whether you look at Abraham and Isaac, is not instruments, not singers, but an altar and the treasure of someone's heart on it. That is the beauty of worship, eh? It's not singers, it's not instruments, because it was never meant to be a musical term to begin with. But it is an altar with the treasure of someone's heart laid on it. And so in Abraham's case, it was the treasure of his heart, Isaac, that lay on it. In the father's case, it was the treasure of Jesus Christ, his son, that was laid on the altar. And so one of the things I have to ask myself, and you read about that in Genesis 22, verse 3 to 10, uh, with regard to Abraham. But one of the things I have to ask myself every time I lead worship is, hey, Jacob, what are you laying on this altar today? What are you laying on this altar today? And I want to lay my heart, my emotions, my body, my spirit, my entire being. Worship that does not engage my entire being. And it doesn't have to be musical then. Oddly enough, um, in uh, Genesis 8.21, uh, most uh, versions just say, um, a pleasant aroma rose to the Lord. But if you actually look at the word, it's, the, it's a word that has the same root as Noah's name. Um, I'll just pronounce it for you. It's ni koach. And it means rest-inducing aroma. Rest-inducing aroma. When Noah offers, and Noah's name, by, by the way, means rest. When Noah offers the sacrifice to God, it's, uh, the actual sense of the word is it brought before God a rest-inducing aroma. And so part of, I mean, if you took away singers and instruments, then what does worship look like? Worship in, uh, in Jewish understanding forever has been prayers, offerings, and music. Prayers, offerings, and music. Brought to God with an attitude of obedience. Brought to God with an attitude of obedience. Whatever you say, oh God, you want my son Isaac. Well, you gave him to me. And therefore, I'm quite sure that as I lay him on the altar, that you have the power to raise him from the dead. What do you want, O oh God? I'll build you an altar, but I ain't going to build no free altars. And so I say to you, Ornan, that you may be giving me this land, but I'm not going to take it free. I'm going to pay a price for it. I will not offer to God anything that does not cost me. What shall I give you, O oh God? You never craved for sacrifices and offerings. You wanted someone to lay down his life. Well, here I am with my body. I shall lay down my life and it shall be an offering that shall restore mankind back to you. This is why Samuel says to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Church, May the next eight months prove such marvelous obedience, such willing obedience from us, eh? Such willing obedience. I pray for you. I pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I can begin with Acts 29, Father, and may it ripple across the earth. But I pray, Abba, that as you look at this small church, that you will find servants that are obedient, sons that are obedient, Sons and servants that are obedient. That'll be our worship, our sacrifice upon this altar that we built to you. The treasure of our heart will be the will.
that we have offered. Our will no longer ours but yours. The same statement made in Gethsemane. Give us Holy Spirit the audacity and then the ability to say with Christ that not our will but your will be done. Because you've got such a desire for the earth right now. Such a desire for the earth right now. And guys, that aside, uh, surprisingly, COVID has enhanced our worship in song too. COVID has enhanced our worship in song too. It's pushed us into places in God, in spirit and truth. I mean, um, I was just uh, uh, doing this very unscientific survey of some of the guys at Acts 29, asking them uh, how they were dealing with online worship. I was fascinated to hear how people are pulling their curtains and then sometimes singing uh, at the top of their lungs or sometimes dancing. That the quality uh, of uh, uh, the live stream isn't uh, affecting their worship. And I'm thinking, how come it isn't? Because God has been able to push us even in terms of our worship with music into places that uh, are very difficult to go to without being in a gathering sometimes and having that mass feeling, well done. First Chronicles 16 verse 4 to 7 tells us how important worship with music is. Uh, and it talks about how David had 288 prophetic singers and 4,000 Levites singing the truths of God. And they would do that night and day, 24-7. And they did that for 38 years. And during those 38 years, there were no wars in Jerusalem. How nuts is that, man? And so, I really believe that one of the things God will expect of the church at this point is this ability to engage not in, uh, oh, let's come and sing some songs, but exploring different forms of worship. One, so that wars may cease on the mountain of God. And two, so that God may be magnified through our obedience, and through our hearts that engage His majesty and His presence. We'll talk more about this in the future, but I just wanted to paint broad strokes of what this will look like going into um, modeling for post-COVID realities. The next thing, ah, any questions? Any questions? Any questions, guys? No? Okay. The next thing that happens um, that we need to prepare for is that cycles will be restarted. Cycles will be restarted again. There will be a return to regularity in the world's cycles, and there will be an increase in the intensity of man's sinful nature. There will be a return to r a, a predictability in the cycles of the world. It's amazing how quickly we forget and go back to our old ways. But what will happen now is there will be an intensity in man's sinful nature. We talked about it last time. So the three things I remember from last, last time is uh, uh, horrible sexual exploitation. Uh, horrendous uh, exploitation of child labor. Um, ridiculous increase in pornography. Um, and um, rich fat nations and people spraying on uh, weak, thin nations and peoples. Cycles will be restarted. Nations and governments, this one is particularly important, and for Acts 29, this will be significant. Uh, nations and governments, rulers and kings, giants of media and commerce, and the purveyors of false religions and doctrines will be exposed. Some of them will fall. Guys who have three years left in their electoral mandate will be removed or will fall. While others who were not yet known will rise. In some of the largest or most populous nations of the world, governments and political leaders will be removed post-COVID. They'll be partly removed because of their... Um, because of the way they dealt with 
people because of the lack of mercy, because of the lack of humility. Even though they have a mandate, they will be removed. And the church has to prepare for that. Not along Republican or Democratic lines. Not along Christian or Hindu or Muslim lines, but along the lines of this is what God is ordaining. How is the church preparing? It's odd how cults know how to prepare for this. Every time a communist nation has fallen, within a matter of two years, every known cult from the West is already inundating that place with money and with churches. We can say in the past that we didn't know, but my God, now what do we do? But prepare with our resources and manpower to go into places where God is once again shaking a nation so that only the unshakables remain and we can start building. But come on, Jacob, we are so small. I am so small. I'm not going to go into any nation. We're talking about the body of Christ. Majority of one. Small, big, doesn't matter. If you were big, he'd whittle you down to 300 so that you can't claim glory anyways. You throw a starfish back into the sea, it matters to that starfish. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it's a great cliche. The other thing that will happen, guys, is kind of hidden in Genesis 9, verse 3. Genesis 9, verse 3. And the principle I draw, want to draw out of Genesis 9, verse 3, is God is going to extend the mandate of the church to cover everything. God is going to extend the mandate of the church to cover everything. God turns to Noah and says, I give you everything now. Before it was just trees and plants, I give you everything as food. And God is saying, I'm giving you, I'm extending your mandate, church. I'm giving you uh, uh, the, the ability to now begin to uh, cover everything. And while some churches will still talk doomsday, while some churches will still talk about wealth transfer, while some churches will still talk about harvest, churches that position themselves under Genesis 9-3, knowing that God is willing to release far greater uh, territory and clout over the nations of the earth. Churches like that will begin to operate in Isaiah 45, 1 to 3. I must read it. I must read it. Because this, this is when words that were written by a prophet thousands of years ago come to life. Isaiah 45. And I'm reading this over Acts 29 and over the churches that position themselves. Because God is saying, just like I did in Genesis 9-3, I'm going to extend your mandate to cover everything post-COVID. And here's what he's saying. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. And I'm going to leave the word Cyrus out. Because we are. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze, will cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. The treasures of darkness are the souls of men. Wealth transfer comes when people are not interested in wealth. But the treasures of darkness is the souls of men. Remember that story where the king of Sodom is standing next to Abraham who is standing with Melchizedek. And what does Sodom say? Give me the souls and you can keep the money. And we like fools at times are churches that are desiring money when there are souls out there that need to be saved first. I'm tired, man, of this wealth transfer nonsense. It will come when it is no longer important. Do you know who it will be transferred to? To the weakest amongst us. How did wealth get transferred in Egypt? They asked their wives, who had been slaves for 40 years, whose backs bore the mark of Egyptian whips. They asked their wives to go knocking on the doors of their Egyptian masters and say, give us our due, give us the money that you have held back from us for 400 years. And by some strange reason, for some strange reason, they took raiments and gold and jewelry and gave it to these women. Ah, something's... Ah, let's go on. Though there is a reason to get indignant sometimes, guys. 
there is an easy reason to hold that noses because of the stench of sometimes what comes out from churches. Here's another interesting uh, thing that we have to be aware of, and uh, Jeevan will talk some about it when uh, he does communion. It's that whenever God reestablishes mankind, whenever God reestablishes mankind, he always follows it with the birthing of a set-apart remnant. Whenever God, when God reestablishes mankind, and whenever he's done this, he always follows it up by setting apart a holy remnant. You see this um, uh, shortly after they come out of uh, uh, Egypt. You see this when Jesus started with his 12. You see this when um, whenever, whenever the people of Israel came out of a very severe time, God would reestablish the earth or mankind and he would follow it by birthing a set-apart remnant. And so w when you really think of it, guys, the rainbow in Genesis 9.13 is followed by circumcision in Genesis 17.11 and then that is followed by an invitation to steward in the Sabbath rest of God. Let, let, I know I went through that fast, but that was deliberate. And so you've got to be aware of what God is up to based on the history that we uh, see repeated in the Bible. So what God does is he'll reestablish mankind or reestablish uh, how the earth should function. And after he reestablishes the earth, and that is evident in the sign of the rainbow saying, I now reestablish the earth. Once he does that, he'll take you to, he, he follows that up by calling aside a remnant. And he, in the Old Testament, this happened in Genesis 9, 13. And then in Abraham, he calls aside a remnant. And there is a covenant sign. This was a rainbow. Here, it's circumcision. And you find that in Genesis 17, 11. And then he follows that up by inviting those set apart to steward the earth again by entering into Sabbath rest. And that has a sign too. It is the day of Sabbath that he ordained with Israel. These are three token covenant signs that you'll find in the Old Testament. The rainbow, circumcision, and the Sabbath. It establishes a pattern. And what is the pattern we are looking at? Remember what we are saying. We are trying to forecast what to expect and therefore how to prepare. And our data is extracted from Genesis 8 and 9 so that we know how to prepare. And we're looking at the broad strokes. At this critical stage in the history of mankind, it's going to happen again, where God is saying, hey, the waters are receding. I put my rainbow in the sky. I'm reestablishing the earth. But as I do that, and things begin to go back to normal, I'm pulling again out for myself a, a, a remnant that is set apart, that is willing to be obedient, that is willing to go and do whatever I tell them to as I reestablish the earth. And then as he does that, he says, but I want you to do this out of rest. I want you to rule out of rest. I want you to come into a place where you steward the earth that I'm reestablishing again. And as you do that, rule out of this place of rest. I've done this throughout history where I reestablish the earth. I then call out a people and then I cause them to rule. I've done this again and again and again. And I'm doing it one more time. But is my bride listening? 
And so I would say to you, let God use the flint knife of his word upon your flesh so that he can renew your inner man. And so as we go post-COVID, don't socially distance from each other in terms of spiritual social distancing. Let equippers, let pastors, let those who lead you, let people who are older than you, let those that are spiritually better than you, use the flint knife of the word of God to cut away the foreskin of our outer life so that the inner life may be circumscribed to God so that he can have a set apart remnant to do what he wants on the earth. Because these are patterns that God has followed man. It's not that he can't break out of patterns, but it is that he has given us a word to know certain things that he keeps doing. Because there's nothing new under the sun, and he knows how to work things. The process may vary. Any questions? No questions? You, you may have to go and listen to some of the earlier uh, teachings to understand what happened to the earth over the last three, four months. That the globe is rarely brought to a standstill. That the evil that perpetrated this must be resisted. And that once it is resisted, one does not take one's foot off the accelerator. That once resistance is broken, then rebuilding must start. Nehemiah goes, checks out the city. He has received permission from the king to go ahead and check out the city. He goes, checks out the city. He has got people that oppose him. He uh, is able to subdue them. He receives greater mandates from the king. Everything is provided. His was not to survey or to stop enemies who were mocking him. His was to rebuild the city. When you think of just yourself doing this, you'll come up hollow, eh? You'll say, what can I do? Maybe I can give a hundred bucks here or go deposit a mask or two there. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a thousand different things done by a hundred different people that brings down a wall or builds up a wall. Let's look at some other patterns. I got three more and then we're done uh, with the teaching. Sometimes I like uh, spelling the word rainbow a little differently. Sometimes rainbow must be spelt Rainbow. We are taking back the rainbow. This is kind of a rainbow. Um, in Genesis 9.14, you'll see that the rainbow emerges out of a cloud. It's very odd, eh? And I don't think... We realize this because we sing, the Lord said to Noah, let's now have a floody, floody. Because of that song, we miss out on some of the truths about uh, the rainbow. So in Genesis 9, 14, the rainbow emerges out of a cloud. And the reason God allows or causes a rainbow to always emerge out of a cloud is because the clouds were a sign of judgment. And so what God does with every rainbow is he causes it to emerge out of a cloud so that people realize that there is a sign of deserved judgment that is now replaced by mercy. You'll never see a rainbow without a cloud. Yep. Yeah, sure. Our great leader, Derek, is going to read out a question that was sent. Great leader, Derek, go ahead. 
Do you want to do it on camera or? No, thank you. Thank okay. You. What does cutting away a part of our flesh look like? Is it giving up something as a representative? Example, being sober from now on, or is it something different? Okay. Uh, cutting away of flesh is uh, uh, John's idea, or was it? Uh, yeah, I think it's John who, or Matthew who says it, is uh, this idea of denying oneself and carrying the cross, denying oneself and carrying the cross. That's the idea of cutting away of the flesh. So it would be, um, how about, l- let me give you a simple, simple, simple exa- example. Denying my right to be offended. Denying myself the right to be offended where you do things offensive, but I choose not to be offended. Instead, I choose kindness and mercy. It is letting the inner man begin to rule and the outer man not become any more prominent. He's not dominant anymore. Paul talked about it in 2 Corinthians 4 this way. He said, through the, through, through the years, the outer man is wasting away, but the inner man is being renewed. Where I begin to operate by the life of Christ and not by the life of Jacob. I begin to live the life of another, not the life of Jacob. Where this treasure that I carry in this jar of clay becomes more and more evident. Where the veil of flesh that is the usual way that I transact business with the world is no longer the table across which transactions take place. It is, it is the spirit man that rules. It is the Christ way that becomes evident. It is the fruits of the it's the fruit of the spirit that becomes the attitude that rules. And so if you go down that uh, uh, whole section of the fruit of the spirit, forbearance, kindness, love, peace, joy, these become natural. At the end of the day, <laughs> the cutting away of flesh is to become like Christ. I was talking about the rainbow, Genesis 9, 14. Always remember, guys, that uh, when you look at the rainbow, please notice the clouds. Please notice the clouds. Because the clouds are meant to remind us of deserved judgment that is now replaced by mercy. And why a rainbow? I mean, we've, we, we've put the two words together, and so we lose the actual meaning. In Genesis 15, 3, The Old Testament refers to Yahweh as a warrior who would subdue his opponents with a bow and a quiver full of arrows, as it says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 9. It says he has a bow and a a, a, a quiver full of arrows. This was Yahweh the warrior. This was the warrior who would subdue the earth. This was the warrior who would judge his enemies. This was the warrior who would bring down hostile forces. And then with the rainbow in the sky, it's a radical reinterpretation of what the bow would normally be used by Yahweh as. The bow is no longer a symbol of combat or judgment. It suddenly becomes a symbol of peace. And so here is a prophetic reminder. And I don't throw around this word prophetic at will. And so I've very def- deliberately written down this word. Here is a prophetic reminder. And listen to this Acts 29. Listen to this church. This year, and 2021 and 2022 will be years of unparalleled restraint and mercy from God, where despite defiance and greed that the world will begin to exhibit like never before, God will have rehem or compassion and hesed or loving kindness, as we said last week. Let me read that again. Here is a prophetic reminder that this year, the remainder of this year, and in 2021 and in 2022, These years will be years of unparalleled restraint and mercy. And the church must get used to this. Because the church begins to rise up when people are defiant and perverse. And yet God is saying these three years will be years of unparalleled restraint and mercy. I'll change the bow that I use to judge people. To you, I'll use it as a bow of mercy and it'll be a time of unparalleled restraint and mercy where despite the defiance and the greed of the world that awaits us in the months ahead, God will have tremendous rahem as in compassion and hesed as in loving kindness. And the sooner I embrace it, the more God will be able to use us in the world that awaits us for the next two years.
So how should we respond? Start casting your bread upon the waters. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 from the New King James. From the New King James, I insist because it puts it correctly. Cast your bread upon the waters of this flood and after many days you shall find it. Cast your bread upon the waters of this flood and after many days you shall find it. You know, uh, the idea of that uh, a verse comes from this uh, practice or this custom where people would take seed and they would go out in boats over flood waters that were receding and they would take handful, hands full of seed and from these boats they would scatter it upon the waters of the flood. And as the waters receded, the fertile soil that had been drenched with water would cause the grain to spring up. And over the next two and a half years of unparalleled mercy and peace, cast your bread upon the waters of this flood. Acts 29, we must develop such a deep heart of Rehem and Hesed over the next two and a half years. It will be a great advantage to God and the kingdom. Leave alone to us. Great advantage. Judgment may be something that God calls for after, but not for the next two and a half years. Have hearts of great compassion. Seek justice, not for yourself, but for others, which may require the raising up and the pulling down of systems or peoples. But know that it comes from a heart of compassion and of great rehem. And so cast your seed, cast your bread upon the waters. Cast your bread upon the waters of this flood, and after many days you shall find it. Periods after disasters aren't times for harvest. Periods after disasters are times of seeding. Periods after disasters are not a time for harvest. Such a categorical statement I'm making. Periods after disasters are time for seeding. And the good news of peace suddenly will take on wings. It'll be like a horse with wings. Uh, when we were praying last week, someone had this uh, vision of facing eastward. Facing eastward. So if that is north and that is south, then this is east. Facing eastward. And they heard God saying, face eastward and keep moving to the ends of the earth. And so I want you to do something symbolically right now. Wherever you are, just stand or even while you're sitting, find where east is. And face eastward. Right now, guys. Here too. You guys too. No one's exempt. That is north. So I'm assuming this is east, right? Yeah. Face eastward. And God said, face eastward and then start heading that way. Keep moving eastwards. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Guys, these are symbolic acts that sound so uh, childish, but my God, let's not think of it as childish. Let's think of it as childlike. And begin to face eastwards and then just pray a simple prayer. I'll try and, pr I haven't planned this, so I don't know what will come out of my mouth, but you can pray a simple prayer. So Father, we face eastwards. And you told us now that we are supposed to face eastward and keep moving eastward to the ends of the earth. And so send us, O oh God. I'm reminded of Zechariah 6, where there were four horses and chariots, black, white, pale, and another color, red, I think. And you said, go forth. And as they went forth, you said, the horses that are heading towards the north have brought me rest in the land of the north. They have given me rest. They have given my spirit rest in the land of the north. And so we face eastwards and we will keep going. And as we keep going, oh God, bring rest that only you can bring to the lands of the north, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I was aware as we faced eastward that you could see my bald spot clearly. But these are the costs we pay. So um, how do we now practice uh, going forth with the good news? Uh, we've talked about that from Acts 2, 42 to 47 many, many times. Uh, the only thing we'll have to do is intensify that, where we 
keep going down the road of apostolic doctrine, one anothering, breaking of bread, prayers, and generosity. But that's one other time. That's the practice of it. Uh, let me go to the last point and um, um, end with this forecast, and then we'll get more specific in the future. Yeah? When you go to Genesis 9.16, when you go to Genesis 9.16, you'll see that God says, when I see the rainbow, I will see it and remember that uh, the earth was judged and I'll never judge it again. Why does he say stuff like that? Why does he say, when I see it, I will remember? Why does he need this reminder? It's not the first time. Uh, you find it later on in Exodus 12, 23, where he says, when I see the blood upon your doorposts, I will remember and I will cause the destroyer not to enter. I mean, who else lived in Goshen but the Israelites? Why did God say, when I see it, I will remember? Why this reminder? Why does he speak like that? Guys, it's not so much a reminder, but it's a sign. It's not so much a reminder for him. But it is a sign that triggers or um, announces a promised course of action. When he says, I will see and remember, he's not putting it out there so that he is reminded of it. It's more along the lines of, here is a sign that will trigger or announce a course of promised action for the rest of the earth for as long as the earth exists. This is one of the reasons why Israel would have specific festivals. Eh? They would have Purim, which would remind them that should they ever be opposed by Haman, and other evil rulers, that God will send forth a decree that will liberate them. They would uh, celebrate Pashkel, where they would, the Passover lamb would be slain for their sins. They would uh, celebrate Yom Kippur, or it was not actually a celebration, where the sins of uh, the nation would be atoned for. They would be Sukkot, where they would remember that if there is a time where we have to go through hostile territory, the presence of God will be in our midst. They would ce celebrate Shavuot, where it doesn't matter whether they were locusts or whether they were uh, famines, that God had the ability to bring about a harvest as long as first things were put first. And so Israel's festivals were a sign and a wonder to Israel to remind them that, hey, Every time you celebrate this or every time you see this sign, know that I will trigger or announce a course of promised action which I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and which I have said is yes and amen in Christ and it shall happen again. It then allows us, knowing that this is God's promised action, it allows us to prepare our response. And why am I putting this as the last point here? Because this is exactly what God is doing right now. I've been fascinated by the parallels that God has allowed us as a church to draw out from the word. It's almost the same thing that Israel used to do when they would cross the Jordan or cross the Red Sea. They would go back into the river and pull out from it 10 to 12 stones and they would set it up as a heap to remind them or they would take stones and build an altar to remind them this is God's proposed plan of action should we ever be stuck with the Red Sea in front of us and the armies of Israel behind us. It exposes the devices of the devil because he's very limited. He just repeats things, packaged differently. And it exegetes or explores God's promised course of action. The process may vary. Oh my God, he keeps doing this, man. This is what I've been attempting to do over the last six to eight weeks. This is what I believe Acts 29 is called to do at this stage for the world. Guys, for the world. If nobody else hears us, they know that the word has still gone out and that angels stoop to hear and the demonic trembles. Go to 1 Corinthians uh, 10. 11 and 12, I just want you to understand the role that we are supposed to at present play so that we all may 
play it faithfully or attempt to play it faithfully. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 and 12. This will give you an idea of what we are trying to accomplish. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12. These things happen to them. And this is after Paul writes about the uh, about uh, things from Israel's history. He now says in verse 11, These things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of time has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. The intent is, look back at the history of the earth, sons and daughters, and begin to forecast or model what awaits the earth as the waters recede and the rainbow appears. Do it for the world. Be faithful, eh? Small as you are, weak as you are, behold that place before you an open door. Behold that place before you an open door. Yeah? Bless you guys. Yeah. Here's a question. So my immediate uh, answer to that is um, from Revelation chapter 11 or chapter 13, I'm not sure, but it says, and uh, the kingdoms of the earth became the kingdoms of our God and King. Uh, and that what began as a small stone that was not cut with hands began to gather momentum and it became a big mountain that filled the earth. And so... Uh, we do not belong to the kingdoms of the earth, which is why we need to begin to s operate by the proceeding word so that we do not get, uh, uh, we do not bow down to the statues that Nebuchadnezzar builds and tells us um, are, is the way to function here. And so uh, we have to operate by the principles and the values of a kingdom that is in the future that already is through us, the church. But a day is coming that uh, when as we begin to operate that way, uh, the kingdoms of the earth will become the kingdoms of the world. It happens every time you pray. It happens every time you lay hands on someone. Every time someone's body is healed because you laid hands, what do you think is happening? We simply dismiss it as Jesus healed. Absolutely true. But what do you think is happening? A future value of a kingdom where there is no sickness just happened to break upon a person through the laying on of your pudgy hands. What when there's an act of kindness during a time of crisis, when great sacrifice uh, is undertaken by you, where you go hungry to feed somebody, what do you think is happening? Is that a, is that a quality of the earth? Nope. It is a quality of the kingdom to come. Where one who laid down his life for others says, those are real friends. What do you think happens as I preach now? Everything that I'm saying that models a post-COVID era, let's assume is coming from God, which means then that we are releasing here on earth the values of a kingdom that is not visible but is present because Christ is present in his the church and on the earth anyways by his own spirit. And so, yes, we are not of the earth, but yes, we are from a future kingdom living in the midst of a decaying world, bringing the aroma of life to those that are open to it and the stench of death to those that reject it. But that God will judge at the end. There, there is no uh, contradiction. Yeah? Cool, guys. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, before we go to the next part. Remember this sheet? Write down a promise that you are waiting for. God said it, it hasn't happened yet. God said it, it hasn't happened yet. A promise you are waiting for. Just take time to write it down. A promise that you are waiting for. Let's just take time to do that. Can you put that one up, 
Don? Yeah. So a promise you're waiting for. I've got more than one. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Don't give up. God is still on the throne. Don't give up. You're on the brink of a miracle. Just remember that you are not alone. Okay, guys, um, before we go for a break, I got a couple of quick announcements. One, I want to give a shout out to my mom. I may hi uh, to Wayne, uh, to Anne from Bahrain, to Mimi if she's watching in Germany, and to Josh from New York. Uh, just wanted to say hi to you guys. And thanks for all the letters you wrote to Dagmar. Uh, they were very cool. So they'll be delivered to her today. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say was um, uh, this, this um, time of live streaming has exposed brand new talent. And so we've got uh, someone who will be singing for us right now. He's a passionate Canuck fan. Um, I don't know if he wore his Canuck jersey to sing this. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time, Put your hands together for Aaron Yip as he takes us into the break with this song. The splendor of the king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great. You are the name of 
above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great back everyone we'll just give you a little bit quick 20 30 seconds to get yourselves back start before the beginning of time we 
with no point of reference. You spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty your void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Let's sing that again. God of your promise. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty your void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your Evolving in pursuit of what you said If it all reveals your nature, so will I I can see your heart in everything you say Every painted sky, a cat the stars if the stars are made to worship so will I if the mountains bow in reverence so will I if the oceans roar your greatness so will I for if everything exists to lift you high so will I. salvation you chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride sing it again God of salvation God of salvation 
You chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. Sing again one more time, God of salvation, God of salvation. You chased down my heart through all of my failure and On a hill you created, light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But one measure could amount to your desire. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But one measure could amount to your desire. You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Patterns of love, patterns of mercy, Lord. That's what we're singing about, Lord. That's what we're singing about. That's what we're celebrating. With every rock we pile up, that's what we sing here. Patterns of love, patterns of mercy, Lord. Patterns of unending grace, patterns of unending grace, 
just like you did for each one of us, you would do it 10 billion times for the other, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. You would do it a hundred billion times. You wouldn't hesitate a second, Lord. Just like you did for us. Just like you did for us. not on there but um, it's just the chorus from how he loves yeah. and oh how he loves us so oh. Sheldon without piano can we just like oh how he loves us how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us so, oh, how he loves us, how he loves us so, and oh, how he loves us so, oh, how he loves us, how he loves us so. Through you the blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, through you all hearts will sing, through you the darkness flees, through you my heart screams, I am free. Sing that again, through you the blind. Through you the blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, through you all hearts will pray, through you the darkness flee, through you my heart dreams, I am free, I am free.
that's what we're talking about that's what we've been learning about that it's through us through us the blind will see through us the mute will sing through us the dead will rise through us all hearts will praise your name through us the darkness flees in your name Jesus my heart screams, I am free. Yes, I am free. I am free to run. I am free. Through us the kingdom, through us the kingdom comes, and through you the battles won. Through us, through you the price is paid. Through you there's victory. Because of you, my heart sings. I am. the Holy Spirit guys these things will happen because of the presence of the Spirit of God who is the agent of God who brings to pass on earth the desires of God through a community that he built called the church yeah these songs are true man and we got to see it because this is the year of the Holy Spirit remember 2020 that was what was said to us hey um, uh, before we go on um, what's next is it yeah, guys, I um, some, uh, some days ago felt uh, God saying, hey, um, Maya writes well, approach her to uh, write something for the church. And I was blown away by how God helped her to write what she wrote. And so um, she's written this uh, story and she's got a few pictures that go with the story. So before I go to Maya, let's look at the rainbow the third cloud. So the third cloud says announcing a promise, announcing a promise. 
And so what can you announce to the earth right now that you sense God saying to you? If you could at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m., let's not clash with the 7 p.m. people, at 8 p.m., if you could stand on your balcony and take pans and pots and beat them and announce to the earth the desires of God, what would they sound like? So take some time to write down, if not a whole sentence, then at least some points you can develop. I'm not asking you to do it at 8 p.m. I'm just or not asking you to bang pats and, uh, pots and pans, uh, but I'm saying write it down and then speak it out. So what would you announce? Take a couple of moments to write it down. I got my phone on me. I'll write it down. If you had a if you had the ability to announce to the earth what God has for the earth, what do you think God's heart wants to speak over this month of May to the earth or June? What would you announce to the earth as a promise? Here's what I've written, guys. I've written, unparalleled restraint and mercy awaits you. You will see his heart eight billion different ways over the next thousand days. Yeah, that's from the song we just sang. Uh, that song just fit right in. So I'll stand at some point tonight or tomorrow and announce this over the earth. These are promises of God for the earth spoken through his body. Who else will he speak through, eh? Yeah? Okay. So, um, we're going to listen to Maya's story now. And so, this is Sunday school time for the grown ups also. So, listen to Maya's story. Hi, everyone. I wrote a story based on kindness and call it Giving Without Expecting Anything Back. On a cold and breezy afternoon, sat a young girl. She shivered as she sat down on the cold sidewalk and watched the people of the city rush to their jobs. A man wearing a suit and tie passed by the young girl. He stopped walking when she spoke. Sir, you wouldn't mind sparing a bit of change, would you? The man gave a big chuckle. Me? Give you cash? And what would you do in return? The girl sighed. Sorry for disturbing you and wasting your time. That's what I thought, the man replied with a great big smirk on his face. Later on, a middle-aged woman passed by. She had her hair in a messy bun and carried a big stack of papers which seemed to be out of order. The young girl didn't bother stopping this lady. She thought she would get let down again. As the middle-aged lady passed by, she stopped to take a look at the young girl on the street. Chaos in her mind calmed down and she felt her heart drop to her stomach. Then she bent down, placed her messy pile of paperwork beside the young girl and put her coffee on top as a weight so the papers wouldn't fly away. She left and about half an hour later, came back with a bag of food and a warm cup of milk. She handed it to the young girl and a big bright smile appeared on the young girl's face as she took the food and milk. The lady picked up her paperwork and coffee and spoke to the girl. That should keep you full for a while. The young girl stared at the woman in amazement. Thank you so much. How can I repay you? The lady placed her hand in the young girl's cold hand and said, That smile in her face has already paid the price. Then she scurried away. So, as you may know, I have a friend named Janelle, and she was diagnosed with leukemia in March. 
um, just right before spring break started. So she was she's now going through chemotherapy, and as you know, that can be that can drain your energy and just drain your happiness. So um, since I like art crafting, um, I decided to spend my first week of spring break um, making her a huge card with her name on it and drawings of her favorite cartoon characters from Japan. Um, then the second week, I spent that uh, week making a scarf that had colors that resembled her personality and just aspects of her life, things to, just things that she liked. Um, so on our way to her house to drop off the gifts, my mom decided to buy her a big plushie. Um, when we were giving the stuff, we didn't expect Janelle or any of her family members to pay us back. When her mom sent me the pictures of Janelle with her gifts smiling, it made me incredibly happy. That price became paid. Jesus didn't tell Peter, I'm going to die for you and the whole world sins, but you have to give me all the money you have on earth and everyone else's money as well. No way. He just did it because he loved his people. And that is the true and greatest act of kindness ever. Hello, church. Okay, so it's time for communion. So, oh, sorry. It's, oh, camera is this way. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, get your uh, bread and then juice ready. So we're going to do communion <clears throat> together. Yeah, young and old, children, families, if you're single at home, Jesus is with you and we are with you online. So get your bread and then juice ready. We're going to do it together today. Can I have bread as well, Mr. Derek? And also grab your juice too, together. All right. <clears throat> Today, as we take this one, God wants us to position ourselves um, uh, differently than before. So this is how it goes. Um, as Jacob taught us, the sign of the covenant, every time when you see the sign, a sign of the covenant that God has made, uh, it should trigger something in us. It should, it, it, it should trigger the course of action of the promises whatever God has promised. So it should trigger. Today, as we take this communion, I pray that God triggers something. So, um, you know, the day Jesus Christ broke this one, um, he changed the meaning of the Passover. He changed the meaning of the bread. He changed the meaning of this, this cup. He wrote a new covenant. But I want us to go back to the Exodus chapter 12, in the, the first time when they broke the bread. So the first time when they broke the bread in their homes, what happened was the, uh, uh, the scripture says that this is how God asked them to do this way. God asked them to do this way. Like when you do, when you do the bread, when you, when you, do the, when you break the bread, uh, God asked them three things. The first thing he said is, fasten your belt. The first thing he said is, like, fasten your belt. And then the second thing, uh, the second thing he said was, um, so, so the second thing he said is, put your sandals on your feet. And the third thing he said, take your staff in your hand. So these three things he said, because... The day then they were doing, right after that, God knows and everybody knows that they're going to walk out of the bondage. They're going to walk out of, from where they are to a new promised land. 
And after thousands of years, when Jesus Christ, when he decided to change the meaning of this communion, the meaning of the breaking bread and the, and the cup, he did the same thing. John chapter 13, if you go to John chapter 13, we know that Jesus Christ, he knelt down and then he washed the uh, disciples' feet. But that's something different on that day. Because, because the Bible says, John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he, had, that he had come from God and was going back to God. He rose from, he rose from, the sub, um, he rose from where he is. And then he said, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel. And he knelt down and then he, he, he put it around his waist. And then he poured his water and then he washed his, uh, the feet of the disciples. So Jesus Christ, look, look what Jesus Christ did. There in the Old Testament, the people had to fasten their belts because they, were, they had to walk physically out of, the, out of the bondages. Here, Jesus Christ, he himself, knowing that everything God had given to him, the authority, the power God had given to him, knowing where he had come from and knowing where he is going, he himself, he fastened the belt. And then he said, there in the Old Testament, they had to put their sandals. But here, Jesus said, Jesus, he took off their shoes and then he started started to wash his, his feet. In, in a different terms, Jesus wants, to do, Jesus wants to say to all of us that today we don't have to put our shoes like the physical shoes and then get out because Jesus Christ has finished everything he has done. And then he finished on the cross and then he said, you are going to be in rest with me. You are going to walk in rest with me because I have conquered the death and I have paid the way and then I have finished it. So church, as we take this one today, I want us to posture this. Everything you're going to do from now onwards, it's going to be from the place of rest. It's going to be from the place of promise because you know what Christ has done. And you also know what is going to happen because you're no longer servants. You are sons and friends. And then you know what God wants to do. Uh, do to through all of us so take the bread break the bread and then when you break the bread position yourself rest with him and then start asking him lord what do you want me to do what is that something triggering in my heart maybe you maybe god has been asking you for a long time to do something and you've been waiting and this is the time that the church has to rise up the church has to stand up the church has to take up the place of the rest and then start doing things what god is asking us to do so that's the position today we're going to take, eh? So break the bread, and then I'm going to pray after this one. Jesus, we remember. We remember what you have done on the cross. But at the same time, we don't want to get stuck there. We remember the calling that you have called us. We remember what you're expecting us to do. We, we remember where you're calling us about. Take the cup. So Abba, we pray, Abba. If you can raise your hands and then let's let's pray. Let's praise God. He has finished the work, but at the same time, there is something that is triggering in the church. There is something that is triggering in the in the hearts of the church today, as we position ourselves the same way. The same the same way. Every time when we see the sign, every time when we see the rainbow, how the, the promise, the covenant hits us so hard, so hard in our hearts, and then how he, it prepares us that he has given us the covenant. Today, God is going to, God is going to do the same thing in the, in the hearts of the people. Abba, we pray, Abba. We pray. We pray, Jesus. Thank you so much. Whatever you have done on the cross is actually giving us life, and it's actually rising our hearts, Abba, rising the church, rising the church. So we give thanks to, thanks to you, O oh Lord. O oh Lord. I call forth the holy nation. I call, for, I call forth the chosen people. I call forth the royal priesthood. I call forth the prophets. I call forth the people who worship you in truth and then in, in spirit. I call forth the people who can dismantle the plans of the enemy. I call forth the people who, di who disarm the uh, enemy, the, who, who dismantle, who's dismantle the plans of the enemy, who destroys the plans of the enemy. I call forth 
forth the plunders of the kingdom of the darkness. I call forth the, the people who restore justice. I call forth the people who are called to be light and salt of this, this earth. Abba. Thank you so much, Abba. Jesus, you have done it. And then we're going to do this from the place of rest and the, from the place of such a safety, such a protection. We thank you. We remember what you have done on the cross. And we remember our calling today. And then we are ready to walk out. We are ready to, we are ready to step into the calling. The calling that you have called us to go into the world because you have anointed us with the power of the Holy Spirit to preach the kingdom and to set the captives free. And then thank you so much, Jesus, for whatever you have done on the cross, the death and the sacrifice and the rising up. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hey guys, um, just remember that, eh? So we are a people who rule out of rest during a time of unrestrained mercy. Um, and we are ready with our sandals on, our belts fastened, and our staff in hand to move with the Holy Spirit wherever he goes to benefit the people of the earth. This is the role of Christ and his body, repairers of the breach, restorers of streets to dwell in. Yeah? And uh, I love this next song that Betty is going to sing, Reckless Love. So as Phoebe comes to play the um, keyboard and Betty sings, enjoy. Uh, sure. But now that I've mentioned Phoebe's name, you've got to show her. You've got to show what she's wearing. This is Phoebe, and she's got her own little uh, Canuck shirt. Yeah? Phoebe, that way. Look that way. Look that way. What can you do? People have eyes just for me. Anyways, reckless love. No. 
I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you can light up, mountain you won't climb up, come after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, come after me. Guys, we're almost at the end. Uh, let's go to the fourth rainbow, the last one. And uh, if you can now ask God from a prom for a promise for someone else, for a promise for someone else, it could be a scripture or it could be a rhema word for someone else. And so write it down. Like I have... Um, a scripture for someone else and it's from the book of Acts and uh, I don't even know who it's for but maybe it applies to more than one or two persons and it's saying uh, I will save you and your family just as I brought Noah and his entire family into the ark so I will bring your sons your daughters your sons and their wives your daughters and their husbands and your children into the ark so that you will not travel alone. They will all be saved. So if you have a promise like that for someone else, write it down in another's promise. So we did active promise, awaiting promise, announcing promise, which we will speak, and now another's promise. Can you take some time and write down a promise for someone else if it comes to mind? And if it doesn't come to mind immediately, you can always... Uh, Send it to them rate later or write to them later. Just take a minute and see if anything comes to mind. Here's a promise for Rosalind. I don't know if she's listening, but if she is, just uh, sends the Lord saying, uh, Daughter, the kindness you have shown over the last 70 years is going to come back upon you like a wave. And it'll just, just be so refreshing. The kindness that you have shown over the last 70 years will come back upon you like a wave. It will break upon you like a wave. And the years ahead will be good years that um, you will live um, harvesting the seed of kindness that you sowed over the last 70 years.
whatever you've started to write, guys, um, you can complete later if you haven't finished it. If you're absolutely sure it's an encouraging word that you need to send to another, feel free to text them and encourage them. Eh? Let these be words of encouragement. Um, I want to end with this song. Um, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I love that song because of who it says God is. And uh, as you sing that, no church, that we've been called for a time like this to rise up ourselves and to raise the churches around the earth to fulfill their role uh, as the waters recede and the rainbow appears, eh? Come church, let's sing it together with the same gusto you started the service with. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working.
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you're the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Let's go ahead. You're here turning. You are here and you're turning lives around and we worship you we worship you you are here you're mending every heart and we worship you we worship you your way maker and you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Church, we're going to uh, pray and finish our meeting. But I was just thinking about this. We are a community of the Spirit. And so even though our online service ends now, our communion with the Spirit continues on. So as we wrap up, uh, I want us to pray together. Because we are not, it's not just one person praying. We are praying as a church. So we're going to respond to everything that we've been hearing today. Let's do it. Father, we thank you. We thank you. And I want to declare and say... You're a good God. You're a merciful God. I thank you that the years that lay ahead of us, 2020, 2021, and 22, they are years of restraint, and that there will be mercy and love poured upon this earth. And Father, I say and we say as a community of the Spirit, we thank you for your word. We receive it, and I thank you that goodness and mercy on one hand will follow us, but on the other hand, that will follow those we have conversations with. Goodness and mercy will follow those who we encounter because the God of encounters lives in us, amongst his people. And so we thank you for what lies ahead of us, and we say we thank you for that. We welcome it. We receive it, Father. Father, on the other hand, I want to say we are rising up as an army. We are rising up as a people. I thank you for your word that you said the earth will be covered by your glory. And so we are your glory upon this earth. And so a people are rising up. And we say, yes, it's not a man or a woman. It is a people that rise up. And at Acts 29, we say we are ready for rising up. And so even right now, as we wrap up in prayer, we say we thank you for what lies ahead. And we receive your promises. We thank you because you are our shield and our eternal reward. We thank you that the treasures of darkness are ours. We declare it and we claim promises over it. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. As we go, your protection is upon us. There is no one who rules the earth other than you. You reign over the earth. And we thank you for your promise. In Jesus' name.